On this week's episode of 90 Degrees, we are joined by the formidable Alex Kane, CEO and founder of Sport Trade. Today, we discuss the Spanky Valley situation, sports betting laws, and market makers. You can find Alex on Twitter at A underscore Kane 47. And you can find Sport Trade at Sports Trade underscore app. Let's dive into the sharp bomb, side and look bomb, at the right bangers, angle. Down, bangers, big bangers, bangers. Ladies bomb, and gentlemen, down, Jews and Gentiles, bangers, sharps bangers, and squares. Bangers, bangers, you are now tuned into another great episode of 90 Degrees, where we are giving you the right betting angles. Today we're joined by Alex Kane, CEO of Sport Trade a new sports betting exchange here in New Jersey, as well as soon to be other states as well. Alex, uh, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us what Sport Trade is and what makes it different than the other sports betting apps? Yeah, Kevin, thanks so much for having me. I thought that it wouldn't be possible to fit that many square and nine 90 degree puns in one statement. You did quite good. Um, it's really great to have uh, you know, to have me on the show. Um, happy Friday. Um, yeah, so so what Sport Trade is, is it's trading meets betting. Um, I know you you got to check it out over the last weekend. Thanks so much for, for doing that. Um, we basically bake every single sports outcome into basically a stock and we attribute a price to that uh, outcome. And that's simply the probability of that outcome to occur. So if you take, you know, tonight's game, uh, the Golden State Warriors are playing the Sixers, and let's see here on Sport Trade, Gold State's trading twenty-two dollars. So in an American odds, that's probably plus three eighty, plus three seventy, plus three fifty, somewhere in there. Um, and the fun thing about Sport Trade is that you can trade in and out of positions, very liquid markets, very tight markets, zero delays, zero spinning wheels. So you could buy in the Golden State Warriors at twenty-two and buy, say, 10 shares at that price. And because that price is just indicative of the probability, the game goes in play, and that's where sport trades a lot of fun. Maybe they go on a 12-2 run to start the game, and they're now trading 32. And now you sell your 10 shares you bought for 22 for 32, and you made $10 times 10 shares equals $100. And then the way we make money, sport trade, is we take a 2% commission on that profit. So 2% of $100 is $2. You've now bought the Golden State Warriors pregame at 22. They took a 12-2 run in the first quarter. They're now trading 32. You sell your 10 shares. You make $100. Sport Trade makes two. You keep 98. That's what Sport Trade is. It's a real-time platform that allows you to trade, to bet on the probability of anything to occur pregame and in-game. So the in-game wagering, loving that aspect of Sport Trade, that you don't have to wait for the spinning wheel. You just place it and... You don't have to worry about the sports book having more information than you. Um, but would you still suggest that people place their live bets during commercial breaks just to be sure that they have the quickest information available? Yeah, probably. Or is that only uh, a good tip for the other apps? Well, I, th- I think I think um, generally, you know, even, even the folks that are watching during a commercial or they're betting during a commercial rather, and they're watching on TV, they may be on Hulu like me and be as much as a minute behind. So they think they may be betting at a timeout. Um, but in fact, they're betting um, during the game. It happens to me all the time. I think I think you just have to naturally yield as a better that that you are on the losing side of data asymmetry, that, you, that you're, you're, you're going to be reacting to data if you're watching the game or listening to the game later than a sports book. So the best way to approach it is to simply open something like unabated live odds screen open. The sports rate uh, is on, which is great. And look at the price of the book you're betting on versus other prices of other books, because that at least levels the playing field somewhat. Now you're looking at reality only a, a second behind as opposed to seven seconds or, or 60 seconds behind. For sports rate specifically, you know we have a price up probably about 85% of the time during an NBA game which is a little bit higher than even some of the other sports books in New Jersey. Um, and, and it's an instantaneous fill. So I wouldn't encourage customers to do something they're not comfortable with, but I think, you know, if you're used to that spinny wheel, if you're used to the, as soon as you place the bet, the odds move, 
you know, all of that's gone on sport trade. And we've seen customers really react to that well. We've seen two, three, four, five, eight thousand dollar in play bets, which are executed um, with zero delay. Now, what if I'm at the Jersey Devils game and I noticed that a player was pulled and there's a power play and right before it shows up on TV or many live feeds, I bet the team that has the power play advantage, let's say the Devils, um, you know, is there anything like, does it, does it happen that people can get it in quicker than the data comes or is that that brief moment where it's frozen? So I tried doing this at a Phillies game this year with our non-production environment. I found that the market moved with between a second and two seconds after the crack of the bat. But if you were a user and you wanted to go to Prudential Center and you had two phones open, one queuing up with a huge trade on the Devils and one queuing up a huge bet on the Wild, and you were quick enough, you could place an order faster than the market maker knows what's happened. Um, I will say that we have built a lot of technology and have thought a lot about this problem. And I think we probably thought we would have court siders a lot sooner than we, than ultimately we will have. But um, court siding and people trying to get a one-up on the market are just very natural evolutions of marketplaces. And I don't think it's the exchange's job explicitly uh, you know, to limit or ban those independent customers. We would have to come up with a exchange-wide set of rules or market microstructure to, to counteract that. We were prepared to roll that out during the World Cup, but we just haven't seen, you know, that sort of activity. I think customers have been definitely a lot of sharp best customers, definitely a lot of winning customers, long-term winning customers, but they're doing it in a way where they're not using speed as their predominant strategy. But to answer your question, you know, I don't know when the devils play next, but it's definitely, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, I don't know if I'm ready to buy devil's tickets just yet. I mean, it's weird. I live pretty close to the stadium. I've actually never been, um, but you know, it's certainly, you have to be quick and mm -hmm. you have to still make the right judgment call too. Cause you could have this courtside information but you could overvalue it. Now you could, overvalue it. you could make a mistake. I tried doing it for the Phillies game and I, you know, the crack of the bat happens and you have to make an estimation. Do you think the ball is going to end up over the shortstop's glove or in the shortstop's glove? And there was one particular moment where I thought it was going over the shortstop's glove. I jammed by, you know, probably about half a second after the hit, uh, but before the ball ended up, ultimately in the shortstop's glove. And now I was like, I actually bet the wrong way. Um, so it doesn't come without risk. It doesn't come without a ton of cost. It's assuming that the Wi-Fi in the stadiums are 100% um, up to snuff, which we all know the one time where your phone doesn't work is when you're at a large sporting event. So there's some logistical challenges to doing it, but I think it's possible. Or location tracking issues when you're close to a state's border. Exactly. I mean, which is odd because I think New Jersey, when they first legalized sports betting, a strong majority of the sports bets were placed 10 miles or less from the border. I think we're seeing this from either Philadelphia or New York City. Yeah. Now, you, you guys, you have these market makers who provide the mm -hmm. odds rather than profit exchange, friend of the show. Uh, where the users are providing the odds. How do you find these market makers and what sort of criteria did they use for setting their lines? So I think uh, I, I think Profit may have some market makers on the platform. I would have to ask them, but I think market makers are a very important part of the ecosystem because you know if you think about like take the take the Warriors versus Sixers game. You know, the vast majority of bettors out there, um, they, they just want to get a bet down. And in, in, in the sport trade case specifically, they just want to put a position on because like, oh, I'm going to buy the Warriors here. In fact, they've just dropped down to 21.5 here, as I can see on the unabated live odds screen. It allows you to see any odds 
um, in the zero to 100 sport trade price as well. So I just want to get this bet on, you know, put this position on the Golden State Warriors at 2150 because I think they're going to make a run here. Most people don't think of it in terms of like, I'm going to, I'm going to enter my own price and then hope somebody matches that price because, because what happens if the price is not matched? And if you, if you take that to the in-game example, it gets even more exacerbated because Steph Curry just made a three. Oops, Joel Embiid just did a dunk. Oh, timeout. Oops, foul. It, the market moves so fast that it's not possible with a single pane of glass in your two thumbs to move the price fast enough so that you have a lively market. So that's where market makers come in. They provide this super liquid, lively, dynamic market in which customers can also say, you know what, I actually do want to bid for a better price for Golden State. I don't want to pay $21.50 a share. I want to pay 20 bucks a share. And you can do that just like you can on profit and ask for a bit of price improvement. And there may be someone on the other side that wants to bet the you know Sixers at 80. And there you go, you've now made a trade. But I think market makers play that first like critical party starter type uh, role that you know at least sets the initial prices in the market, especially when there's not a lot of interest. You know, you go to a college basketball game or a, you know a college bowl game that's maybe not so desirable. There's going to still going to be customers that want to place trades and place bets, and market makers have to make sure that there are prices against which they can they can bet. Now, how does someone become a market maker? Can I just say, hey, Alex, I want to be a market maker. I'm going to put in my own cash and I'm just going to copy pinnacle lines. Uh, or yes. is the process more involved in that? Well, you it would start like that for sure. And then uh, market makers uh, you know, have to receive a level of licensing um, in, in New Jersey, which, which basically sees them as providing a service to us, the operator. And that, the service they provide is, is liquidity. Um, you would then sign a market making agreement with us that would say, I, I, I guarantee I will be uh, quoting these markets with this sort of depth, with this sort of width, you know, two days before the game, day of game, an hour before the game, in game for this percentage of the time. Um, and that's, you know, that really is what makes it a, a market making agreement that you can't just pick and choose your spots. You are agreeing to kind of put markets, um, you know, to quote our markets with a very, very high uptime. Um, and, and so it's possible, I think, you know, the, the licensing here in the U S is such that it, there's not a ton of interest. There's, we've gotten a lot of people that say, Hey, do you have like an open API? We don't have that at the moment. Um, I think it's, you know, unclear, you know, where someone would be coming from in terms of geolocation if they were using an API. And I think they still have to get regulators comfortable around that concept. Ultimately, I think we could have stuff like that where individuals can trade a bit more algorithmically on the site. But for now, you kind of have two classes. You have the, the, the mobile user, which is iOS now, Android coming soon. And then kind of the market maker who's like, okay, I'm less betting and I'm more providing this liquidity service to, to support trade. Now, does the market maker know which users are placing the bets so they can profile these customers, even though they're not allowed to deny the bets? You know, just in case this market maker wants to know uh, which is which are the sharper numbers and when to adjust. So that's not something that, you know, that's something you'd, you'd see on a sports book, you know, when market makers are in the heat of the moment and they're quoting markets and they're getting fills, you know, at that time, they have no, even after the fact, they have no ability to know who just filled them. So they, you know, and it's, and that makes it harder, but it's also, you know, a balance for us of like, what's, where's the line as the exchange? Like, does NASDAQ send, you know, the second you get an order, does it, does it say, hey, Citadel, here comes, you know, Kevin is pretty sharp, is buying 10,000 shares of Apple. No. Um, that said, we are not a stock exchange. We're a sports betting app. And where is the line? And I think I think we're we're still toying with where that ultimately is. But at the moment, yeah, if a market maker gets a fill, in that moment, they have no idea who just filled them. They just have to infer like, okay, large order size, or this this order size was thirty five hundred. And when I tend to get filled by exactly thirty five hundred dollar orders, I tend to lose more than I win. 
and they just kind of have to do price discovery in the in the most pure format, which is they don't really know their counterparty at the time of of getting fills. Does that make sense? Yeah. So essentially, they don't know for a fact who is betting these. Right. So they can't just say, "I'm just going to move my number based on the sharp action." They have to do their own analysis on where they think the game is. Yep. And even compared to Pinnacle, if I have pinnacle here on on you know on an odds checking site um the prices are way way tighter than pinnacle way tighter way tighter than any 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 venue in the world so not only do they you know are they forced to engage in battle with um on more level footing with the with the rest of the with the betters you know it's not like they have a nuclear bomb and the better has a pea shooter you know it's 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 hand-to-hand combat for everybody but the markets are a lot tighter too. And so what that means is that if your prices are wrong, then, and I'll, I'll, I'll put up Pinnacle here and is Bookmaker on here, Bookmaker's on here as well. If I look at that same Sixers game or if I look at the Hawks game, you know, you can buy the Hawk, the Hornets at 60.2 on Pinnacle. You could buy them at 59 on Sport Trade. You can buy the Hawks at 42.4. On Pinnacle, you can buy that 42.5 on Sport Trade. To make that in the American odds sense, let's see. We are plus 135, minus 144. They are plus 135, minus 151. And so it means that you're going to be the first target because you have the tightest price. And so we have very, very tight prices. Uh, and much like profit, when you know you have tight prices, you're going to be the first venue that's going to get hit with adverse selection. And that's just kind of like the fun and the honest truth of exchanges. And I don't think we want to shield that from our market makers or shield our customers from that. There will be losers, there will be winners. Um, and, you know, to ban the winners and keep the losers is the only thing, as I've said, that keeps sports betting from being a carnival game. And and that's not, that's not our business model. So that's the honest truth about the market makers. They have a really tough job. They do a really, really good job. And you know, I think we're one of the only sites in the U.S. or globally that has that has no delay on top of those really tight spreads for in-game in-game markets. So now the biggest name on gambling Twitter, Spanky, mm -hmm. is a professional better whose popularity rose because he was getting banned everywhere and tweeting about it. And he built a big following, started a podcast, um, which... I don't know if I just knew of any sports betting evergreen podcast before his somewhat the inspiration for this show it was the inspiration for circles off. If I also had to guess I'm on the circles off YouTube channel, I consider myself a little brother of circles off. So here is this guy betting tons of money and he gets hooked up with sports trade deposited in cash in person at Bally's a hundred thousand. Then you know, something happened because obviously if you're a kick-ass better betting that much money, you're going to have enemies. He's not able to use uh, the platform. So essentially, why can't Spanky use sport trade and other sh sports bettors can? Yeah, so uh, this, this was uh, something that Spanky did, I think, a really good job recounting on... Be, be better betters on his podcast and the reasons uh spanky is no longer allowed to bet on any bally's property and thus by extension sport trade is the same reason he's not allowed to bet on many mobile operators that may or may not may or may not want him to bet that you know i'll, I'll uh I know that uh, Caesars is a property that no longer accepts Spanky's action. And I believe Fubo used to be in the, in the market. Uh, Profit's obviously a, a partner of Caesars. If Spanky went to those venues, even if they wanted to allow him as a customer, they would not be able to. And the reason is, is in New Jersey, the land-based licensee holds the ultimate say. It is their property. We are sim simply renting a house on their property. And even though our house is digital and their property is physical, even though Sportrade is a website or an app and not a, not a physical casino, 
it is valleys and it is those land-based licensees that have the final say. Um, now this is a customer we wanted on the platform. This is a customer I think, you know, was, you know, true to our whole promise that we want to bring, we're a marketplace. There's going to be winners. There's going to be losers. There's going to be people that help shape price discovery. As Spanky mentioned in his podcast, he met one of our market makers and that market makers wel welcomed him with open arms as did we at Sportrade. Um, you know, I don't want to venture a guess or I could venture a guess. You could venture a guess as to why Bally's didn't want to accept the customer but it wasn't based on his play. I think it was more based on his profile, you know, in, you know, even outside the sports betting industry, just his profile. And, uh, you know, unfortunately we are caught in the middle of that, but we're trying to be the best partner we can be without the Bally's partnership, without a partnership with a land-based casino, we can't operate in New Jersey because unlike in many other countries, you know, it's the, it's the casino that has the license. And, uh, you know, your, your viewership and folks that are listening can decide whether they think that makes any sense at all. But for as long as those are the rules, those are the rules. So it's a sticky situation. The customer, based on their play, we would have loved to keep on the platform. But we are aware that the rules state that we don't have that final say. And, uh, again, not venturing a guess as to why the customer was removed from the platform, but it certainly was not based on his play. And you handled this issue perfectly well. You talked to him directly. You let him know it wasn't you. You let him know you tried to get him in. And putting on my former elected official hat, because I used to be one night legislator, if I were you know, in charge of making um, any sort of gambling policy, you can't get anything done without making the casinos happy. So if it's a horse racing thing, you got to consider the casinos. That's why... You have so many casinos attached to horse racing tracks. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you had sports betting with no casinos involved whatsoever, the casinos would fight it tooth and nail and it would never get passed. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it's more of a reflection on our wheeling and dealing political culture than people thinking it's good policy because they're, they're legalizing sports betting, not because they think people should be able to bet, but because they see it as a source of revenue. Yep. You're hundred percent. The lobbyists would have none of it. I've, I've learned so much about how sports betting and, and I guess by extension, every law comes to be. And I have learned like lawmakers do not make the law. Special interests make the law. It's just like, they write the bill. I'm, the first time I saw that, I just thought to myself, like, this is, this isn't real, right? Like they write the bill. We can opine on it, but they like industry, like insiders don't actually write the bill. Nope. They write the bill. Um, you know, I think, I think the U S is unique in that way because casinos exist in the United Kingdom and casinos, you know, that would be like if Netflix had to partner with Blockbuster, does Netflix have to, does, does Robin have to pay Ameritrade because Ameritrade has a land-based, you know, you know, presence in the state of Texas to have a customer in Texas. You know, of course not. So it's a it's a it's a crazy policy. Um, it's just going to take time for you know the industry to work the way it should, and I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. I think you're totally right, but you're you're totally right. It's more about how the policy gets shaped by the lawmakers than it's like who who thought of this idea type thing. And we can even get a legislator on, and we can ask him about it because I know, for example, the state senator that represents the area where I used to be an elected official is the one in New York who's proposing uh, the bill to kind of restrict these risk-free bets or at least the language about it. Um, because I'd be interested how many of these state legislators actually bet on sports themselves. It's a good because, question. you know, they shouldn't have to partake in it. But if you, if you look at other similar industries, you want someone with a background, like if you're regulating alcoholic beverages you want someone who represents a vineyard and talks to vineyards so that that certainly would be a great episode now but besides spanky not being able to bet at sport trade are the captain jacks of the world able to bet i know clive bixby 
is the one who put me onto your app, got me in touch with you, friend of the show, Sharp Better. Um, mm-hmm. Are any other Sharps or proven winners having any difficulties with Sport Trade? They are not. Fantastic. Why, I don't want to where I don't want to speak for for Captain Jack. I think he's he's talked about kind of his experience in the platform, um, which has been great. And he's certainly been someone that's adopted, you know, the platform very quickly. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of customers that have won a lot of money on Sport Trade. Uh, and uh, you know, not only do we as the business welcome that and recognize it to be true, but critically, you know, the market makers understand that that is you know the these are individuals that came kind of from the capital markets and were market makers on kind of the world's largest stock exchanges and commodities venues. And they know that like when you're making markets on a, on what's called a lit venue or a stock exchange, as opposed to a dark pool. Oh, it's not like a lit venue as in it's like a party time. It is not a party time, lit. although the market makers are the party starters. So maybe there is something there, a double entendre, if you will. Um, but but if you're but if you're but if you're on the venues where you don't get to see your counterparty at the time of you know being traded against, uh, you're more likely to trade against informed what's called toxic toxic flow or the exhaust, and that's just like how the world works. To con- concoct a, a counter reality that isn't that is is just doesn't make sense to us as, as a group of people as the as the exchange as you know. Uh, the market makers as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's something we welcome and, and, and we continue to do so. And, you know, to answer your question, we have not removed any player for winning. Or would we? That is fantastic. Now I'm just thinking about like you guys as a business and how impressive mm-hmm. it is what you guys done, even though it's very early that essentially the reason why you have FanDuel and DraftKings in every state is they're a big corporation they're usually the ones writing the laws about what type of sports betting is allowed. And on top of that, they have higher margins because they can kick out winning betters. They can have a casino. They can have parlays. They can have other bets where you don't know the house advantage and it's ridiculous. And you guys just offer mainline bets with a low margin. So you're, you're in a meeting with these investors and the Mm -hmm. investors say, I don't know about investing with you. You know, these other businesses have a better model, the European model, it makes more money. Why should yeah. I put money into your company? What do you say to them when they when they express doubt on your business model compared to the European model? Yeah, I, I, I don't think you could argue that the European model for some segment of operators will be very successful. That is a very safe bet. Um, it is not successful for operators three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way through 150 or how many of our operators are now in the US in one state or more. I think our pitch is very different. It's, and there is a learning curve to this, by the way, if you're listening and you're in New Jersey, you know, you could be like, you know, I'm not really a stock trader. These words are scary to me, trade, uh, position, risk, commission. And I totally understand that. And I think we are continuing to learn more and more about our customers and just the right way to position the product. But the longer term pitch is that, you know, by creating a whole new activity that for every customer that wants to place the same game parlay on um, the Golden State Warriors versus 76ers game, that there's at least a subset of customers, if not equally the size, who say, you know what, I'm going to buy the Warriors. Warriors are 20. Man, this is a great team. I know Steph Curry might be. I'm going to buy them at 20 and just see what happens. They get to 40, I'll sell them. That you can bring in a new audience that wants to do something different that they can only do on your platform. And if you can do that, you create a captive customer. And if you create a captive customer, you don't have to bonus the customer or invest in the customer in such a competitive way. And I think that just by looking at the way like Robinhood came to be of like taking something pretty complex and getting millions of people to understand like how to buy shares of a company, you know, we think it's possible. We may not have nailed it yet, but we think it's possible to do the same thing for buying shares of, you know, the Golden State Warriors to beat the, the Sixers where the price is just simply the probability. No dividends, no stock splits, no reverse stock splits, no nothing. 
If this if the Golden State Warriors win, share price settles 100. The Golden State Warriors lose, the price settles zero. And you can buy in dollars and you can, you know, obviously buy in shares or what we call contracts. Um, that's the pitch. And I think uh, we'll pick up some of the price sensitive customers, which are great. I think that's been our biggest audience so far, for sure. Um, but it's a very different vision. It's a long term play. It's to create something different and ultimately something that can be accretive to the overall ecosystem. That's the pitch. So essentially, the investors here, OK, here's a sports book that's doing something different. Mm -hmm. That you guys are letting people bet. And if they win, we encourage it because they keep coming back for more. Now, what do you pitch to the market makers? Because the they, market. they may be like, well, we don't know who's winning with us. Mm -hmm. How are we supposed to adjust our lines? Or are they just confident in their ability at setting prices that they don't care? Yeah, so, you know, this is uh, this is such an important part of the the conversation, the, the, the arithmetic that goes into all of this. If you think about any big kind of, or even smaller financial trading firm, um, there's a lot of ways that they create value, that they make money. One of those ways is through market making. And uh, if you take, for example, like there's a newer exchange called Memex, which is short for the members exchange. Um, it is a lit venue. Um, it is one of, I think, 14 or now 15, uh, you know, national stock markets in the U.S. They have many market makers on their cap table. Many of their market makers are investors in the platform. And therein lies how a market maker can actually create value more than just the bid out for spread. More than just saying, well, if we take bets at, you know, the Charlotte Hornets at minus 141, and on the Hawks at plus 135, there's a six cent spread there, and there's some edge for us. That on top of that, you know, well, we want Sport Trader, we want in the Memex scenario, we want Memex to be huge and get market share. And we're offering to, you know, we're offering to create an even tighter market because whereas we may not win from the market making side initially, we can make Memex really large. Well, if we apply that to Sport Trade, you know, just given that's how a lot of these venues come to be. You know, these are conversations that we have with market makers of like wanting to create more alignment with the business, because ultimately you can say to them, well, we're going to get a lot of sharps early on and uh, customers are going to be more likely to win than they are lose. You'll sharpen your models. And over time, we're going to continue and invest uh, in bringing in recreational and retail flow. And ultimately, every dollar of volume you get in the venue increases the value of the, of the ecosystem. And if you're an investor in that ecosystem, there's now a reason for you to do that. And so what is in it for the market maker who wanted who wants to do this? I think the more they want to put in to this sort of venture, the more they're going to get out of it. If a market maker goes in and says, oh, I have to make money in year one, you end up with a situation where you may not have markets when the game goes in play. You may not have markets when the market maker doesn't feel exactly comfortable. And if we at Sport Trader are trying to create this entirely new ecosystem where we are the only operator in the world to have zero delays, where you could literally place a trade as the football is like floating through the air, that we want to get to 100% uptime, then that means the market makers are going to have to make a market sometimes when they're not exactly sure if somebody's sitting inside the Prudential Center. But the net net is that if they even if they lose on those transactions, they gain the enterprise value of building a brand that welcomes all comers, as you've said, Kevin. And so that's what's in it for the market makers is, is it's more of a business venture where market making is a part of the overall portfolio, not a means to a short term end where I'm going to make markets on this venue and I got to be profitable tomorrow. And if I'm not profitable tomorrow, I'm gone. Because then you have this very adversarial relationship between the market maker and the exchange. And as we've seen, before, at least in capital markets, like that just doesn't, that just doesn't work. Now, are any of these market makers providing odds for other sports books or right now they're only working with sports trade? Not to my knowledge. Um, you know, and that may go back to the, you know, the concept of creating the alignment on the cap table. Uh, although we'd certainly welcome, you know, 
other odds providers that are on other sites, uh, even traditional sports books to take a look at sport trade. What you gain in, in kind of making a bit more of the revenue um, you lose in kind of having the operator ban winning customers for you. And for operators that are certainly those, those out there that are not comfortable with that trade-off that would rather collect their 10%, 12% revenue share, not take any of the risk and know that the operator will do their part in banning any winning customers, in which case they probably don't have that much confidence in their model um, versus ones that maybe have more confidence in their model that want to take a little bit more risk um, and are okay, you know, putting up some of the capital to fund to fund that that activity. Um, so, you know, initially our market making fleet is small. Over time, I think it'll be slightly larger. I think the, the optimal number is no greater than five because you want to create that, you know what, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm one of the two NBA market makers, for example. And I, like, I got to make sure, like I really can't take a night off. And But in return, I don't have to compete against nine other market makers that are picking me off every time I'm wrong. Because as we've learned from capital markets, that's really uh, not a not a fruitful uh, exercise that ends up, you know, with people building microwave towers, trying to get from Frankfurt to London and back within ten milliseconds or whatever crazy stuff they do to try to uh, to try to to try to win the speed race in capital markets. Now, before you were in sport trade, what was your experience with this when you were just a customer? So my experience is, a, you know, from building sport trade, I was in college, I uh, started using Robin, I thought that was incredible. And I just saw how many other folks started to use it. And it was less about it being free and more about it, like speaking, I think, to our generation, you know, it was like, you know, you could mm -hmm. sign up in, you know, on the mobile phone, and you could link your bank. And like, it was, it was native, and it was snappy. And, and the experience was something I think you'd expect for the trust with your money. And then someone showed me sports betting. It very looked very much like a spreadsheet. I had not had, you know, experience with American odds yet. I, it wasn't, it was something I was new to. And I just thought at that moment in time, like it's inevitable, right? Someone's going to build something that feels like trading that, that brings together, you know, the world of, of Robin hood and, and, but doing it in a sports betting sense, because that's what many people are doing on Coinbase and, Gemini and Robinhood, they're they're taking they're making short term predictions. You can buy the front month call option the day that it expires now, on Robinhood. So place a bet, and it will either settle in the money or out of the money, and you're going to make or lose money accordingly. And so I think there's such crossover in those activities that that's ultimately the impetus for sport trade. As a better myself, I, I really learned about the sports betting industry once coming up with the idea. And I spent probably two years doing a lot of the R betting. You know, if anyone remembers Odds Boom, which was this odds comparison site from a few years ago that was ended up being my favorite website because I would go, you know, to Colorado and Virginia and uh, where else did I go? Uh, obviously, New Jersey, New York, Michigan. Uh, Michigan, I didn't do. I should do Michigan because, uh, as you know, a lot of these sites allow you to recreate account when you get to a new state. And so I did a ton of arbitrage betting and I learned truly the value of an exchange of like, oh, wait, there's the better price aspect as well. And I think that's really interesting. And we certainly have a lot of folks on our platform that that's only that's the only thing they're doing. And they could care less about the stock trading experience and the the UI and everything. You know, we've just added American odds to our site, which is a very requested feature because a lot of people want to see like, well, I see on unabated here, you're plus 194. And uh, DraftKings is minus 200 and I have a free bet on, you know, on, you know, DraftKings and I want to arb that and uh, I want to be able to see American odds. I want to do that quicker. And that's when we realized, well, why don't we add that for those sort of customers? So that's been my experience. I'm certainly not a sharp, but I will, I will, when I place a bet, get the absolute best price to kind of trim that horse house edge is, is slim. Now, even though you don't describe yourself as a sharp, did you ever get kicked out of books for arbing? Um, I, I'd say I can still play about on half the sites that I originally started on. Um, I haven't been kicked out. I mean, I, you know, I, my bet is down to $2.10 or whatever, or some of these venues, I get a really long spinny wheel. Like I watch my dad place a bet on DraftKings and I place a bet. I'm like, wait a minute, my delay is way longer than yours. What the heck? 
Um, you know, for the amount that I'm betting, fifty hundred dollars, I can still get that down on about half the venues I use. Um, but I certainly have seen that the, you know, the golden age of getting deposit matches and free bets, you know, and tracking all that. I used to have a spreadsheet where I did all that. You know, I for me made a ton of money. You know, uh, still on the entrepreneurial salary, being able to upwards of double that just based on like finding the free bets and, and matching and finding where odds disagree. Um, yeah, I that that's that's over now. And I can still, you know, if I would bet fifty dollars at Fanduel, they'll take a hundred for me, hundred fifty. DraftKings is obviously, admittedly, a little smaller, and some of the other sites is much smaller. But I'm still able to get my fifty dollars bets down on most venues. Now, were all the arbs you did scalps, or did you do some middling as well? And did um, you also mess around with props? So I did a I did a middle last night, or not last night, a couple nights ago, and it was for this some college. Uh, College basketball game. I don't even remember the game. Um, you know, I'm I'm one of those folks that you know, I'll use bet stamp, I'll use unabated, I'll use odds jam, and try and figure out where there's value. And I don't know what game this was. Uh, a couple months. It was Portland State versus SCU. I don't even and and I found plus over one fifty two and a half, and under one fifty five and a half. And the great thing is over 152 and a half was minus 110, but the under 155 and a half was uh, plus 104. So even if the game didn't land on middle, I only would have to pay that six cent middle. Uh, and the game ended on 153. I think that's the first time I ever hit a middle. And, you know, I'm betting on a total on both sides or whatever, but it's like the greatest thing ever. So I did a little bit of that. Um, a lot of it was, you know, plus 240 over here, minus 220 over here. I have a free bet on the plus 240 side. I'm capturing 83, 84% of it um, sort of things. I don't really know much players on many teams. Um, you, you know, uh, I, I do some of the player prop stuff and try to find- Let the markets do the talking. I do let the markets do all the work. You know, I don't, I don't know anything about any of these sports really. But if something's you know minus two hundred on one site and plus one ninety eight on the other site, you know it's it's a coin toss for me, right? I'm only I'm only paying such a small edge, so I'll have I'll have a bet. Yeah, I mean I'm just like laughing. I show my friend teasers and reverse teasers, and like I don't really follow much NFL. Um, I'm actually winning at it this year, and the person's like, "Why are you going with the Lions against the Vikings?" Da da da. da. And I'm like, because they're plus four and a half and I'm reversing them to minus one and a half. And there's some people that you show them a great betting angle, but they're still trying to handicap the game rather than, you know, stick nice. with what the markets set the price at and how any sort of related bets are not factored in for the pricing. Yep, precisely. I, I find a lot of my friends do try to just pick the side that wins, um, you know, and like water on rock, it could take years for them to realize that that's, uh, you know, what do you want? I mean, it's tough to tell someone that, you know, minus 110 means this, and it's just a really dark, grim message to tell your friend. They're like, come on, I'm just trying to have fun, fun here. And, you know, so I ride up landing is like, well, let's just, just try to find the best price. I'm not going to discourage you from placing the bet, but if you can find like, plus 100 instead of minus 110, like, don't you want to win, you know, $9 more on your $100 bet? That's the way I can kind of get them. But, you know, for convenience sake, you do have, and this kind of goes back to the, the business model of sport trade, you, the vast majority of po folks are just not going to have the money in multiple sites. For as much as that makes zero sense, betting for the vast majority of people is entertainment. Um, and so it's really even hard, like my dad, my own dad, like he's doing parlays. He does same game parlays. He keeps his money on one or two books and he won't deposit 500 more on FanDuel and withdraw it from DraftKings because FanDuel is six cents better, even though he should, because to him, you know, as some of our customers have given us feedback before, we don't want to, it's not great being kind of like learning, you know, and feel like you're the teacher and I'm the student. And so 
you know, the business model behind Sportrade is like, well, what if what if we could make it more than just about price? What if we could take price completely out of it, right? And do the zero to 100 thing and be instead known for like no delay in play betting. We're buying and selling and like, oh my gosh, I shorted Ohio State at this price or I shorted Argentina at this price and now they're here. You know, to me, like that's that's what we're really excited about because I think it's, it's, it's proven, Betfair has proven, it's like really hard to get like enough of the audience to care solely about price, even though that is the 100% logical thing to do. Yeah, I noticed that you guys, your cash out odds are fair. That you're actually offering what it's worth if I were to arb the other side. Because I look at these cash out offers sports books give like on multiple leg parlays where they've hit multiple legs and it's way less than it would have been if they just had only those legs and they had a win. Right. How has your experience been on, on sport trade, checking out the platform, buying it? Have you tried any kind of in play? Um, how yeah. I mean, the one bet I did with the in play and I did a future. Um, I mean, I'm just going to be excited to watch the national championship for college football. I went on Michigan and mm -hmm. I'm excited to see like during the game, how Michigan does and what happens to the price, like looking at the future. I think you're going to love that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think we it's just started. Insane. Yeah. I think we just started trying to support, which we now have yeah, futures for in play. So nothing gets taken off the board, so to speak. We have that someone, something happened today in the bills market. I don't know what, but someone got the bills to win the AFC, I think at 32, and then they went as high as 37 and the customer, I think, sold some. Um, but I think you'll, you'll really enjoy that. Who does, so it's, it's Michigan, TCU, Ohio State, um, and Georgia. Georgia. Who, does, who does Michigan play first? TCU. Oh, okay. So you're looking good. What, what, uh, what was Michigan's price, if you remember? I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was better on your app than all the other sites. Great. So profit well, might have had a better rate, but I think you guys are actually better than profit. So, so the fun thing about this is you're right. Like whatever you bought on Michigan, you know, if if they take a lead in the first quarter, that that price, your your portfolio is going to go green, and it will like you're right. You're totally right. The cash out value in sports trade is exactly equal to just betting the other side. It's just that when you do that, we'll give you we'll put money back in your account instead of you having to place another bet. Um, on the opposite outcome and we withhold both of those sides um and yeah so that'll be live in play you know they take a 14-0 lead i mean think about how cool this is they take a 14-0 lead you sell out of everything and then tcu scores two touchdowns and ties the game up now you buy back in on michigan buy low again so you have this like it just opens this incredible kimono of potential uh, you know possibilities um that i think i think i hope you really like but it's cool. You've had a, a great experience so far. All right. Do you have any last words for today? No, thanks so much for uh, checking out the product and having me on. And I, I think I really enjoyed the conversation about the, you know, political side of things, as well as some of the, you know, behind the scenes of, you know, fundraising and, and, and the market makers. And these are things I think customers are really interested in as well. And, uh, you know, I hope, hope the listeners enjoyed, you know, a slightly different take on, on things I know I certainly did. And I want to thank you for, uh, uh, for having me on today. Thanks for coming on. And I encourage everyone to check out sport trade. If you live in New Jersey, big bomb, bomb, bangers, boogie down, bangers, big bangers, bangers, bomb, boogie down.